Okay, good morning. Uh, this is Friday, February 26th. It's 8.30 in the morning, and this is the House Health Care Committee. Uh, this morning, we are going to hear testimony from a number of witnesses uh, regarding a proposal to expand Dr. Dinosaur to pregnant women and children of Vermonters whose immigration status uh, does not make them currently eligible for Dr. Dinosaur. So I'm going to turn this over to, uh, well, first I want to say I appreciate uh, Representative Black uh, helping to take the lead on working on this and I'll joined by Representative Cordes, who I understand, uh, Representative Cordes, you are going to uh, guide us through the testimony this morning. Yes, thank you, Chair Lippert. And um, I'll echo the thanks to Representative Black for um, leading this. I'm happy to help in whatever way I can. So um, just a time check. We have until what time? We have, we have 50 minutes. Five oh minutes. OK. So we're going to start with um, the executive director of the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, Michael Fisher. Good morning. I think I think they call me Chief Healthcare Advocate. I've been called many things, uh, uh, but um, um, good morning. Thank you. Uh, I, I really want to appreciate um, the healthcare committee. Uh, and I'll echo. I apologize, Representative Black. I'll, I'll echo uh, uh, Representative Black for stepping up and taking leadership. Um, uh, the committee is recognizing that we have neighbors in our midst who, um, who are locked out of healthcare because of their immigration status. And uh, this is a proposal for a, a, a very modest, small change to uh, crack open the door for a, a small set of people um, who would have a, a really tremendous impact, uh, a tr tremendous positive impact in gaining access to prenatal care and care for children. Um, and so I, um, uh, our goal here is to listen directly as much as we can from people who would be in, impacted by this and, and listen to people who work directly with them. Um, these moments happen from time to time where, um, where the moment is right. This is not a new issue, but the moment is right. And um, uh, not only because of our, our current recognition of the needs uh, of racial justice, um, but also because of COVID. If there is ever a time when we need to make sure that people have access to care, all people, um, or as many people as we can manage, now's the time. So with that, I, I will get out of the way and, um, and, and let people who, who know this popular, know, know people who would be impacted by this speak. So I, if I may jump in for a moment uh, as the chair and just say that uh, I'm going to suggest that we hold committee questions until all witnesses have been heard. Thank you, Chair, and um, I'm a Representative Black, and I second that. Um, thank you, Chief, and my apologies for the, the misnaming you. Um, next, we have, good morning, Maricela. I, we're so happy to have you um, in our committee this morning, and I'm very grateful that you were able to take the time. Um, and may I, may I call you Maricela? <laughs> Hola, buenos días, Marisela. Eh, eh, la señora Mari Cordes, representante estatal, le estaba dando la bienvenida eh, y le preguntó, eh, ¿está bien eh, eh, de, de decirle Marisela es su nombre? Sí. Yeah. Y buenos días para todos. And good morning, everybody. Buenos días, Marisela. So, um, please feel free to share with us this morning. Entonces, sí, muy bien. Eh, cuando esté lista, siéntese libre de compartir con nosotros esta mañana su testimonio. Sí, creo que lo podemos hacer ahora. Uh -huh. Sí, mi... Bueno, creo que ya saben mi nombre. Eh, hola, mi nombre es Marisela. Y ahora, ahora vivo en Vermont, pero soy de Guatemala. I think you've already heard my name, but hello, everybody. My name is Maricela, uh, and I live in Vermont, but I'm originally from Guatemala. Y vivimos, vivimos y trabajamos en una granja lechera. We live and work on a dairy farm here. Uh, 
con mi, con mi esposo y mis hijos. And I live with my husband and my children. Y tengo cuatro niños, dos niños nacidos aquí y dos de Guatemala. And I have four children, two who are born here and two who are born in Guatemala. Um, pues, en mi experiencia aquí, pues, en salud para mis hijos. Eh, bueno, sí hay diferencia y, pues, sea. Yeah. Es un poco complicado para nosotros como emigrantes y difícil. And in my experience here, talking about my children's health, uh, there's a big difference uh, between my children. And it's, it's a difficult and it's a complicated experience for me. Pues, eh, como para mis, bueno, durante mi embarazo de... Hace poco tuve una bebé de, de nueve meses, tengo ahora. So I recently had a, a baby. Uh, uh, my baby is now uh, nine months old. Y pues en el, en el hospital o en el médico eh, he ido, estuve yendo, pero después que nació ella, eh, me han estado mandando unos biles muy altos que según eh, el hospital lo cubre, pero esta vez no me han estado mandando eh, un bill de, me están cobrando mucho dinero. Entonces es difícil para nosotros y a veces, pues a veces nos hace de no ir a la, a la clínica porque nos cuesta, o sea que es muy difícil en ganar dinero y para estar pagando mucho es difícil. Uh, and during my pregnancy, uh, uh, I would uh, go to the hospital, I would get medical attention, and uh, after the birth of my child, then I started to get the bills, really high bills, and uh, I thought that maybe the hospital would be would be covering uh, those expenses, but uh, I'm getting charged lots and lots of money. Uh, and that sort of experience makes it so that my family and I decide that in the future, we, we can't go to the clinic when we need to, because it's really hard to make money here. And then, uh, uh, to, to be spending money that you don't have, uh, on, on healthcare is very difficult. Pues también con mis niños de, de Guatemala igual, Ellos no tienen un seguro médico aquí, pues a veces los hemos llevado, a veces han tenido enfermedades así, no graves, pero nos cuesta también de pagar el bill porque es, es muchísimo, es muchísimo dinero que siempre mandan y a veces pues ahí sí que no, no decíamos de que ellos llegan a tener una enfermedad grave grave, pero sí nos cuesta mucho porque tenemos miedo de llevarlos porque nos mandan muy viles, muy, muy grandes o bastante. Um, and then with my children from Guatemala, uh, they don't have health insurance either. And so when they've been sick, and, and thankfully they haven't had any severe illnesses yet, uh, but even with the illnesses they have had, it's really hard to pay the medical bills. Um, because the bills that they send us charge us a, a lot of money. And so we think what, what would happen if one of them did have a serious illness and we'd be scared to bring them to the clinic or the hospital because of the bills that would come afterwards. Pues, por lo mismo, pues, nos gustaría, pues, de que aprobaran algo como un seguro médico para, para nosotros o para mis, para los niños como nosotros, como emigrantes. Pues es, es complicado saber de que no, no tenemos nada y, y pues ya es para, para, la, para el Estado, para la comunidad, como lo podría decir, pues no solo nosotros, pues hay más personas que lo necesitan como inmigrantes. And 
for those reasons, we, we would like to ask you today to expand access to health insurance to, to cover our children, because as immigrants, it's, it's hard knowing that uh, you don't have access to anything. Um, but this change would be something that benefits not just us, but the entire community and the entire state. Sí, pues igual, pues nosotros colaboramos como para trabajar en los, las granjas para, para también yo pienso que el Estado se beneficia sobre de Um, and at the same time, we'll, we'll continue to do our part, uh, working on the farms, and, and I think uh, that's something that the state benefits from as well. Thank you, um, Maricela. I, I um, want to clarify uh, something about, um, do you have children that are, that do have insurance and children that don't? Muchas gracias, Maricela. Entonces, para aclarar, um, usted tiene eh, hijos que sí tienen seguro y hijos que no cuentan con un seguro médico, ¿cierto? Sí. Yes. Los, los niños nacidos aquí sí tienen, pero mis dos hijos de Guatemala no. Yes, my two children who are born here do have health insurance, but my two children who are born in Guatemala do not. Thank you again, Maricela. I am so grateful that uh, you took the time with us this morning to um, share the extreme difficulties. Um, and it, this time that you spent with us will be helpful for our committee to continue working on fixing this, this problem. Um, and I also want to uh, acknowledge your labor um, and uh, the time that you took away from your family um, to spend time with us. I very much appreciate it. Pues muchísimas gracias, Maricela. Uh, uh, te agradezco mucho y aprecio el tiempo que has tomado para compartir uh, esas dificultades y el tiempo que ha pasado con nosotros. Es muy importante para que nuestro comité pueda trabajar para arreglar este problema. Y finalmente quiero reconocer Eh, el labor eh, y el tiempo que ha tomado de su familia para estar con nosotros esta mañana. Sí, pues yo igual, pues es un placer para poder comunicarnos con ustedes y pues nos, o sea, es una alegría para nosotros como emigrantes saber de que quieren hacer algo para poder tener algunos beneficios aquí en este país. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to be here with you this morning and to speak with you all. And, and I also want to say that, that uh, as immigrants, it, it, it also uh, gives us great pleasure to know that there are people like you who are looking to do something so that as a community, uh, we can have benefits here in this country. Bueno, gracias, Maricela. Adios. Adios. Muchas gracias, Maricela. Hasta luego. All right. Um, now we have um, Naomi Wolcott McCausland, who um, will be sharing a, a video um, with more testimony, um, experiential testimony for us. And uh, Colleen Kent, are you able to give Naomi? Hosting rights so she can share the video, or yes, or did you, you should have those it, now? It looks like I am able to. Okay, do that. all right. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to join. Um, as, can you just be sure to um, state who you are and uh, for the record, thank you. Yes. Um, so my name is Naomi Wolcott McCausland. I work with UVM Extension as the migrant health coordinator. Uh, we support access to healthcare services for immigrant farm workers across the state. We cover 13 counties um, and work closely with the Open Door Clinic who covers the 14th county. Um, and uh, Heidi is on the call representing them today. So I, uh, you know, as I do work for the university, but just wanna say that this testimony doesn't necessarily 
uh, reflect the views of the university, but are my um, experiences. Um, more than anything, I want to just be able to pass my time on to two individuals who um, are going to speak about how this um, particular issue has or would impact them. Um, and so it will take a second, but I'm gonna, gonna just uh, pull up a video. Um, they weren't unfortunately able to join today, but felt compelled to share this with all of you. If I may, while Naomi is preparing the video, uh, I wanna express my appreciation to Will Limbeck for offering translation services to our committee today. Um, thank you, Will. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So if someone can just give an audio um, response that they can see the screen. Yep, I can see it. Hola, yo soy Yadira, vivo aquí en el estado de Vermont. Este, mi familia está integrada por mi esposo, mi hijo de nueve años y de un año y dos meses. Para nosotros como familia inmigrante, muy complicado ir al hospital por, las, por los biles que llegan a la casa. Cada visita de hospital se elevan los... Este, se elevan los La cantidad de dinero. Hello, I am Yadira. I live in Vermont. My family is made up of my husband, my son who is nine, and my son who is one year and two months. For us, as an immigrant family, it is really complicated because of the bills that later arrive at the house. Every appointment or visit to the hospital brings an additional cost. For me, during my pregnancy with my son, I had a lot of problems. I had a surgery. And with every visit, the bills increased. You get to the point where you don't even want to go to the hospital because you get to thinking, how am I going to pay for the large amount of debt that appears? With my son who was born in Mexico, if he goes to the hospital or the pediatrician or emergency room every time he goes because he isn't a citizen, every visit could be $2,000 or $3,000 or $4,000. It turns into enormous quantities that are just too difficult for us to pay. And then when we are there, they ask us about paying. And if you cannot, you get these looks like, why are you here if you can't pay? And when they begin pressuring you about a family member's immigration status, you become afraid. You don't know the rules of the hospital. So you think that maybe they'll call immigration. And then you no longer want to go because you're afraid. And it ends up being so much money. I think about the big difference between my son who was born here and my son who was not. For my son who wasn't born here, I can call to try and get him seen, but it takes days. In contrast, for my son who was born here, it's quick. Sometimes I get to the point where I don't even want to bring him in instead try to bear it to avoid racking up the bills. Because if you can't pay the debt, they send it to collections and the people call you and send letters demanding payment. If we had the money, we would pay the bills, but we don't. It's difficult, stressful, and depressing. Hello, good morning. 
To all who are watching this video, my name is Anna Lee. I live in Vermont and want to thank the people who are thinking about the well-being of my family. It is for that reason that I'm recording this video. I am unable to participate in the call due to work, so it was easier for me to make videos for you to see and for me to tell you a bit about my story. Two years ago, I came to Vermont and thank God have been working on a few dairy farms. I have a son and he's always falling ill. So I have to bring him to the hospital. It's very expensive because he doesn't have any health insurance. So I've been receiving bill after bill after bill. For us, one visit to the emergency room and we are charged a great deal. And without all of that money, the bills keep coming. One day I called them up and told them they could just come and get me because I don't have that kind of money. The bills come $1,342 and they didn't do much of anything for my son. Without health insurance, as immigrants, they charge a lot. And what can we do? I would be very appreciative if there were an opportunity to have health insurance at the very least for my son. There are so many others like us who suffer the same. I thank the person who invited me here to speak by video to ask the legislators to expand insurance because it would be a pleasure, something special, if my son could have access to health insurance here in Vermont. I hope it is possible. In advance, I'm thankful. God bless you. Thank you. siga expandiendo eh, esto de, del seguro pues ojalá y se logre eh, yo de antemano les voy a estar muy agradecida y, y que Dios me los bendiga muchas gracias so I didn't hear anything so I'm assuming that you are all able to uh, watch that um, so these experiences um, that we've seen over the past decade plus are not unique. Um, I think something that sticks out for what we have seen with women who need prenatal care um, and children without insurance is that their experiences really vary across the state. Um, certainly uh, the experiences of um, receiving large bills and fear about payment uh, are consistent, but in some cases, hospitals are covering that cost through financial assistance programs. In other cases, care at the hospital um, is not able to happen uh, with, with a financial assistance plan. And so we have seen many scenarios where a family is traveling maybe an hour away to go to an FQ UHC when there's a hospital 10 or 15 minutes away from where they live. Um, and these are families that tend to experience um, difficulty accessing transportation. And so certainly we have seen uh, delays in care um, as a result of um, long distances that have to people have to travel as well as the fear of cost. Um, so I'm going to leave it um, at that and pass it back. Um, Thank you, thank you, Naomi. 
Uh, we'll move on now to Alicia Rodriguez. And we have uh, just a time check. We have a little over um, 20 minutes for um, Alicia, Aaron, and Heidi. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Alicia or Alicia Rodriguez. Um, I'm the communications coordinator with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. And I think the first thing I want to do is just genuinely thank the committee for giving space to hear testimony from um, the folks that we've gotten a chance to hear from this morning. I think mm, that those voices are very, very powerful um, in this conversation, and it's really important to put them at the forefront of this issue. And essentially what I'm here to do this morning is to just um, tell you all a little bit um, about Vermont's complex rules related to immigrant eligibility for insurance. So I'm hoping to just kind of contextualize some of this information and tell you a little bit more about the legal framework um, that exists here. And I just hope to demonstrate how our current system is failing to meet the comprehensive healthcare needs of undocumented pregnant people and children in Vermont. Um, these individuals are members of our community, obviously, as you heard this morning. And fundamentally, I think we have a duty um, to reduce the inequities in our healthcare system, and specifically so when they disproportionately impact people of color in our state. Um, so the HCA, or the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, has both a policy team and an advocacy team. Um, our advocacy team operates a free legal helpline that enables any Vermonter to connect with a paralegal that can help them untangle their legal questions about health insurance. So I spent over two years connecting with hundreds of Vermonters as a member of this team. And while serving as a healthcare advocate, I had the opportunity to learn a significant amount about the complexities and shortcomings of our healthcare system as it currently exists. The advocacy team witnesses Vermonters struggle with a multitude of affordability and access related challenges every day. However, the cases that really highlighted the disparity in our current system are those related to access to care for undocumented individuals. Um, today, you'll, you've heard from these people themselves and you'll also hear from providers who do a lot of fantastic work um, to serve these members of our community through their clinics. However, access to care in these situations is really often dependent on your geographic location in the state and there's very limited access to comprehensive care for undocumented pregnant people and children within these particular settings. Um, I believe that this deficit exists in part um, because of the lack of access to affordable health coverage for these individuals. Um, and it is my hope um, that by highlighting these complexities um, in our system, that can, it can give you all a better understanding of how inaccessible our current system is and how these um, inequities really play out when we talk about um, access to care. And specifically, a lot of these inequities really shift the cost of this care onto hospitals and these low income Vermonters. So to begin, um, I just am gonna you know, throw out a few health insurance terms for everyone. Um, so um, I wanna start talking about qualified health plans and Dr. Dinosaur. So these are traditional health benefits that um, uh, both um, citizen Vermonters and some non-citizens that lawfully reside here are able to enroll in um, if, they, if they meet those financial income criteria. So undocumented Vermonters currently cannot enroll in health insurance programs through Vermont Health Connect. That means they can't get any help um, related to financial costs of their health insurance. Um, they can enroll in a um, direct enroll with Blue Cross Blue Shield or NVP for the full um, and pay the full price for a, for a health plan. However, for most Vermonters, um, regardless of your income level, these prices are unaffordable between the monthly premiums and then the cost sharing that would be associated with that. And really the only um, system um, that we have for covering some of these outstanding medical expenses is through a program called emergency Medicaid. And emergency Medicaid has some really complicated um, coverage criteria. And in addition to that, the application process is very, very complicated and by virtue of that, really inaccessible. Um, so emergency Medicaid coverage is only available to Vermonters who are ineligible for Medicaid because of their immigration status. Recipients of this benefit must meet all other eligibility criteria for Medicaid, 
meaning they must reside in Vermont and they have to meet the income qualifications as well. Um, emergency Medicaid also has very limited coverage criteria. Um, it only covers the treatment of sudden emergency medical conditions. Labor and delivery is considered a covered service for this benefit. However, organ transplants, follow-up care, and routine prenatal and postnatal care are not covered um, under this service. And despite the existence of this benefit, um, it's significantly underutilized within our state, um, considering what we know about this population. Um, DIVA reports that between 2016 and 2021, this type of coverage has only been granted 10 times. And in that period, only one labor and delivery was covered, and there were no children under 21 that received um, payment for those um, covered services. And as I mentioned before, the application process for this benefit is very burdensome. It's actually more burdensome than any other health program that I'm um, aware of. So to apply for emergency Medicaid, a person must fill out a document, a very long application called a 205 AllMed. Um, and then after that, both that individual, in addition to the provider, have to fill out another application called a 201 EM form. And when both of these applications are complete, the provider and the individual client or applicant within that circumstance also has to submit documentation related to their medical bills and their medical claims. And once all of this is done, in, um, it's then submitted to DIVA's clinical team and they're the ones who have the opportunity to retroactively approve or deny this kind of request. Um, so I think that you can get a sense of how complicated this application process is from that, um, from that explanation. And again, it's burdensome. It's more burdensome than any other program that I'm currently aware of. And I'm also not aware of any language appropriate applications or outreach material um, for this particular type of coverage. So I think all of that is to say that currently many Vermonters who need access to care, um, you know, rely on going to hospitals um, for this kind of care. And one other inequity I just want to highlight in this system is that often people rely on fi patient financial assistance within this circumstance. However, Vermont does not have a comprehensive um, framework to really understand and receive patient financial assistance in the state meaning that you can go to one hospital and they may have particular eligibility criteria that you meet. However, other hospitals may find you ineligible um, for any type of assistance, even though you have the same household income and the same household size. So there really is a huge um, geographic issue to access to care within our state that I think is really important to highlight in these conversations. Um, so as we continue to address um, racial equity in healthcare on a state level, I think we have to improve our systems with these community members in mind. Many children and pregnant people in our state don't get necessary care because they don't have health insurance and don't have the money to pay for their medical costs out of pocket. Some children struggle to obtain necessary vaccines and primary care. And pregnant people often give birth in fear because they're never gonna be able to cover um, the cost of that care. Prenatal and childhood access to care are really undisputed um, building blocks for better health throughout life. And um, as Vermont's current health reform efforts um, really focuses on the principle of providing primary care to everyone as a, reduce, as a means of reducing the risk of long-term undetected and untre untreated illnesses, I really think that we need to keep um, access to care for this population and all Vermonters in mind as we continue to reform the system. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alicia. Now we'll move on to Erin Jacobson. You're muted, Erin, there you go. Sorry about that. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to try to keep it brief. Um, I So first of all, my name is Erin Jacobson and I am a professor of law at Vermont Law School. I teach immigration law in the classroom and I also run the Immigration Clinic, um, wherein we work with law students to help non-citizens obtain status in the United States so they can stay here permanently. And our caseload is, is made up of humanitarian immigration cases. So though, um, that's people who are seeking asylum because they're fleeing persecution or torture, 
people who might be applying for trafficking visas, um, U visas because someone is a survivor of a crime, um, domestic violence cases, and cases for special immigrant juveniles who are kids who've experienced abuse, abandonment, or neglect by one or both parents. So those are the, those are the people that we work with day in and day out. And um, almost all of our clients at, at one point or another are ineligible for healthcare. And so I just want to add to uh, Maricela and Yadira and Annalene's testimony here and talk a little bit about um, some other, um, another category of non-citizens who are carved out of um, the um, eligibility categories for Dr. Dinosaur. So um, in addition to the broad category of undocumented individuals who are not eligible for healthcare, um, there's, there's this other category of people who might be, but might not be. And it's very complex. And I'm not going to try to explain all of the ins and outs in the next four minutes. But I do want to make a quick point um, about the, the fact that this is very complex. And that is that oftentimes, even those people who might actually be eligible under our current laws, children and pregnant women who are lawfully present, there are, we often see denials and error by the agency because the, because the rules are so complex and confusing. Um, and then oftentimes, I, you know, sometimes I might hear about this or someone like Alicia, and maybe we can help those individuals um, access healthcare. But oftentimes, I suspect we're just not hearing about it. People are being denied health insurance, access to healthcare, and they don't know that it's a denial and error. So to be able to simplify um, who has access by just saying all Vermont children and pregnant individuals have, can have access to healthcare would be an enormous benefit, obviously both to those individuals, but then too, um, to, the, to the decision makers here. So the category of people that I want to, um, to talk about are those who are lawfully present. And if you are lawfully present, um, if you're a lawfully present child or a lawfully present pregnant woman, you do have access to health care under Dr. Dinosaur. However, what is lawfully present, like I just said, is very complex and confusing. And who is not lawfully present are people who might be seeking asylum but have not yet applied for asylum. Um, the other thing about an asylum seeker is that you have to have applied for asylum and that application has to be pending for six months before you're eligible, eligible for health care. Um, the, the abused, abandoned, or neglected child who is seeking special immigrant juvenile status under the federal immigration laws but has not yet applied for that status is not considered lawfully present under our laws. So you have this group of very vulnerable individuals, people who are fleeing torture, people who are fleeing persecution, people who are fleeing abuse, and their children and their pregnant women, and they are not eligible for health care, and they won't be eligible for health care until they can apply for a very complex, difficult to obtain humanitarian immigration status. And even if you can pull that off, um, that process in and of itself is very challenging and takes a long time. So those individuals are often also new arrivals and they're here in a very vulnerable situation, both in terms of what they're, they're fleeing, but in terms of their legal status. And again, then they do not have access to healthcare. So I just wanna give one example um, so that hopefully we have some time for questions and I'm not taking up any more of anyone else's time, but I think this will help illustrate the, the um, what people are facing and, the, and then um, another, this other category of folks that we're talking about that um, isn't um, 
that's in addition to our undocumented farm workers. So this is a person who came to our office recently. Um, she is from Africa. She is fleeing horrific torture. Um, she wants to seek asylum in the United States. She's been in the US for about a year. She came with her husband, who then in the United States, he became severely abusive. She fled him and that relationship. And she, is, she has now found herself in Vermont. She's with her young child who's three years old and she is eight months pregnant and she is homeless. And she ended up at one of our sister organizations, um, the Association for Africans Living in Vermont. They called us they're trying desperately to find her health care because of the fact that she is eight months pregnant. She hasn't had any health care in the United States since her arrival. Her three year old does also does not have access to health care. And um, she also has a very complicated medical history connected to um, her torture in her home country. And the fact that when she was living there, when she had her first child, her now her three-year-old, she had a very um, complicated and difficult birth. And at that time, um, her care providers told her that if she were ever to have another child, she would need um, a cesarean. And so now she's in the state of Vermont um, with no access to benefits, and it's the nonprofits who are trying to scramble and quickly get her some care. Um, another complicating layer to this story is that a lot of these individuals, um, as I mentioned, they're, they are new arrivals, there's language barriers, and there's also an immense amount of fear about um, whom to trust in our government. And when, you, when she presents herself to try to get some care, there are a lot of questions about her immigration status, and she fears that she could get arrested, that she might be separated from her her child because everyone is hearing about these things happening in the news. Um, and so there's a lot of barriers built up um, for, for um, allowing these people to access healthcare. And yet this could be a very, um, this, this is a life and death situation for her. Um, my last point um, is that when we're talking about these individuals, people who aren't yet lawfully present but will be, for, so for this woman, for example, when we help her and we, we send in her asylum application, she will then become lawfully present six months later. So it's, while she is in an extremely vulnerable, difficult situation now, it's also re a relatively limited amount of time that she is um, excluded from that lawfully present category. So I just think it's important to know that for many of the people we're talking about, um, first of all, it's a limited number of Vermonters, and then also for many of them, it's for a limited amount of time. And Thank I'm you so to, much. You're welcome. Happy to answer questions. Well, we'll before we do that, we're going to um, move on to Heidi Sulis. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Heidi Sulis, and I'm the executive director of the Open Door Clinic in Middlebury. We're a free clinic for the uninsured and underinsured, and we're a member of Vermont's free and referral clinics. There are nine free clinics in the state of Vermont. And to provide a tiny bit of context, uh, last year, we saw 948 unduplicated or distinct patients and almost 400 of those patients were either undocumented workers or H2A, H2B, or asylum seekers. So as I provide concluding testimony among this esteemed group of people this morning and the brave women uh, who provided their testimony, which I think is, um, you know, stories are always the most compelling means by which we can learn of real circumstances. I think that perhaps the most important point I can make today is that by the time patients reach our doors, they are most often frustrated, 
sick and desperate for care because they've hit one barrier and dead end after another in trying to find help. In, in my humble opinion, and I've worked in healthcare since 1985, we are now in a multi-tiered broken system of healthcare that's riddled with inconsistencies and a multitude of barriers to basic access to care that include but aren't limited to language, culturally appropriate care, transportation, daunting bills, prohibitive costs, and last but not least, insurance status. There are so many types of tickets that you have to have in your pocket to get in the door, and they all have to be there at the same time. And, you know, if you don't have them, it's another dead end. This is essentially a recipe for disaster, and we see it all the time from the inside out at clinic. And unless we have blinders on now, we're also seeing it from the outside in as the pandemic has really ravaged this global community. So while in a different day, I would proudly talk about all the good that we do in our community and what a gem we are within an integrated system of healthcare, the fact of the matter is free clinics are safety net organizations. And by the time community members reach us, we're often working in a reactive mode we're working to shore up all of the places that have been neglected by, by a lack of equitable systems. We provide care, we provide case management, we connect people to resources, um, but this is far from what we know in 2021 to be optimal health care, optimal and consistent health care. Optimal care means equitable access for all. And as the pandemic has harshly shown us, None of us is healthy until we're all healthy. Simply put, access to care and basic preventive care are the greatest indicators of excellent outcomes. And so as the executive director, I do a lot of fundraising because our services are free. We can't charge for any of our services and that's a world I comfortably live in. And when I was talking with Mike yesterday about what, what would this actually cost uh, Julia, my colleague Julia and I just did some admittedly very quick research um, and math. And if we in fact are talking about a small number of women right now, I'm just looking at pregnant women alone. I would just like to offer this for some, some thought to you all. Um, you know, we learned yesterday in our Google search that the average cost of a vaginal birth in Vermont is without insurance is just over $12,000. Um, a cesarean birth is over $17,000. And then I threw in, having been a childbirth educator for many years, well, we have to include some high-risk women and some high-risk pregnancies. And I literally pulled that number out of a hat. But if we were to assume that 10% of, let's say we have 20 women we're talking about right now, to put this in concrete terms, and 10% of those are high risk at $100,000 a piece, 20% are cesarean and 70% are normal vaginal birth. I came up with a cost of care of just over $400,000 for these women, which in my view is peanuts for care. Um, so I, I guess, and I'm very happy to take specific questions about what we see and how we work at clinic and either care for people or connect them to resources. But I'd just like to leave you with, I think that it's in the best interest of our society to take care of each and every one of us. I applaud your exploration of this issue and I really encourage you all to move forward so that the human beings behind these categories of people that we often throw out in our discussions, but the real women that you've seen today who have shared their stories and who have taken huge risks to try to do better for their families and come here and contribute to our communities. You know, let's do it so they can be more equitably and optimally served. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi. And before I pass this over to our chair, um, I wanted to, again, thank all of you for your powerful testimony and um, encourage you to 
If you have it, a uh, written testimony to please send that to us so that we can, um, our committee assistant can put it on our, our website. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mari, and each one of you who brought testimony to us this morning. Um, we are at our time limit, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to indulge myself with one question, and I see Representative Houghton as a question, and then I think we're going to finish for the morning. We will return to this uh, possibly at another point in time, uh, but this is this is very very important and uh, helpful testimony. My my one question uh, before hearing from Representative Houghton is. And my understand, and I maybe direct this to Alicia and Aaron. Um, in terms of barriers, I found myself on a number of occasions asking if the barriers were federal or state, and whether we have the ability uh, under state law to um, make uh, available to make Dr. Dinosaur uh, available uh, on a. Uh, to make it more more available to pregnant women and to children of non-citizen Vermonters. And I, I realize this is a complex issue, but if I guess I'm asking in a broad sense uh, whether you see us having the authority and the ability to do this. Yeah, I'm happy to address this question a little bit further. And um, the answer is it's a little bit complicated, but I'm happy to simplify some of the language. Um, so under um, CHIP, um, so the um, Children's Health Insurance Program, which is a federal benefit, um, they actually give states the option to extend prenatal care. So it wouldn't be as comprehensive as Dr. Dinosaur um, coverage, but prenatal care um, to those pregnant women. Um, so that would mean that that individual coverage um, related to pregnancy care and labor and delivery can be potentially expanded under that benefit um, for a state option. When we talk about coverage for undocumented um, youth within the state of Vermont, that likely would have to be something that would be state only funding, just because there are certain federal restrictions related to um, immigration status and enrollment in Medicaid. Um, so certainly there is an option for expansion um, under CHIP and there may be some flexibility with state funding to expand coverage for those children. But there's not a federal barrier to states choosing to do that. that. I guess that's in part my question as well. Um, I would need to be a little bit precise about language here, but what I will say is there's not a federal barrier to extending pregnancy care, so that prenatal care to undocumented pregnant women. And, and, and if I can jump in, other states have done have extended coverage with, with state-only funding. And, and clearly, clearly we, we will need to ask many questions and come back to this, but uh, I wanted to just uh, have that broadly on the table uh, for us to be thinking about. Representative Houghton, and then we're gonna, then we'll stop because we, we need to be on the floor. Uh, our speaker asked us to be on the floor promptly at 9.30, which is when we convened this morning. Good morning, Representative Houghton. Thank you. And I just, uh, thank you everyone. I mean, I sit here and, and and listen to everything that you all are doing to help um, Vermonters. And it's um, very impressive and I'm sure very difficult for each of you. So thank you. I just, I, you know, I, when I think about all of this, I go back to all the things we've talked about with social determinants of health and how important it is for young children to be treated early, to have a good outcome or, or be able to have a better outcome in life. And so if with any of these programs or lack of programs, um, I'm just asking for clarification. So right now there is nothing available for the early years of care. It would only be during, if we were able to do something, it would only be that, that pregnancy piece. Is that accurate? Um, Heidi, I don't know whether you can jump in from the provider perspective. Um, well, I'm not sure if this is going to answer your question clearly, but one of the things that we do with undocumented, so if we are serving families who have undocumented families who have children, let's say, who were born in Mexico and therefore don't qualify for services, what we do, Representative Houghton, is to um, work with them to apply for poorer financial 
assistance and see, and that is by income, see where they qualify. Um, and so do they qualify for 100% free care, 80, 60, et cetera? And then try to place them um, into, for instance, Porter pediatric practice so that their children can get care. I unfortunately don't know beyond that if they can then access a multitude of other programs, you know, that, that depending on what their needs are. I'm not sure if anyone else here can, but so that's how we'll try to get them access to health care. Thank you. Okay. It's very complicated and <sighs> Okay, well, again, uh, I wanna thank uh, Mike Fisher in the Office of the Healthcare Advocate for bringing this issue forward on behalf of uh, others who, uh, and to thank each of our witnesses and especially those who provided direct testimony about their own uh, personal situations. It takes courage um, both to create a video or to uh, come before this committee uh, I recognize that, and I want to uh, expand, extend my, as the chair of this House Healthcare Committee, extend my personal appreciation for that. I do think we need to stop here this morning. Uh, this has been a full but fruitful morning, and uh, thank you all. And for members, uh, let's run down the hall and get to the House chamber.